Well, good morning and thank you for joining me today. And what a great topic we are going to discuss. For those of you whom I haven't met before, my name's Lauren Jackson and I'm a director here in the sales team here at Fidelity. Now, over my 14 years here at Fidelity, I've been really fortunate to see this business step up and try and help educate and highlight some of the really big societal challenges that many women and, of course, men do indeed face and continue to face across the world as it relates to money. Now, I must say that this is a topic quite close to my heart as growing up in a family with huge financial stresses weighing continually on the family dynamics, I saw my mum continually stressed by the financial situation, trying to raise three kids and, of course, you know, put ourselves through school with a high interest rate and high inflation rate environment. Certainly some tough times. But in saying this, as I stand here today, the issues that she faced and the challenges that she faced are indeed very common. Now, some of you may already be aware, but over the last few years here at Fidelity, we've been conducting in-market research, not only here in Australia, but around the world, including our UK, Hong Kong and Canadian offices. And today, I'm actually going to share some of the observations of the research that we did in January this year, a report that we have named The Pathway to Financial Independence. Now, this presentation is by no means trying to tell you as advisors what to do, but more so open up our eyes as to what, if anything, could we be doing differently across our industry. So as we go through some of the findings of the research today, you might wish to think about the types of clients that you give advice to, whether they're young or old, in accumulation or decumulation phase, Perhaps they're retired or divorced or just women in general, as some of these findings may indeed resonate with you in some of the conversations that you're having with your clients on an ongoing basis. And if this is a starting point for you, certainly we'll look to unpack how our clients are thinking and what we could look to do or improve on as we move into the future. And of course, if you would like a copy of today's presentation or report, please feel free to visit or contact your Fidelity representative and we'd be more than happy to assist. So the Pathway to Financial Independence report was indeed an online research survey that Fidelity conducted alongside My Maven's research in market in January of this year. The survey was a random sample of 2017 people, of men and women, advised and non-advised, and a mix of ages ranging from 18 to over 80, and as you'd expect, all with varying circumstances. Now, we asked a variety of different questions to help uncover what barriers, if any, existed in their lives as it comes to money and taking control of their financial situation. And in addition to this survey, Fidelity also conducted a retirement research study in market in September of 2021, which also aligns to some of the areas of this report, particularly around the value of advice and retirement. Now, another area of interest has been Fidelity's female focus groups whereby we conducted focus groups across Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne with advisors of both independent and aligned licensees to really try and capture areas in advice practices and in conversations with your clients where Fidelity can continue to add value. Now, as I step inside this report, what I'm showing you here or one of the initial findings of this report was actually around the current financial situation of the respondee. And what this has actually highlighted to us is that women are less likely than men to feel comfortable about their financial situation. In fact, one in six women say that they are struggling with their current financial situation. For men though, that number is only one in 10. One in five adult women also have trouble making ends meet, 
with one in five believing that they won't be able to easily support themselves and their families. For men, though, again, this number is only one in 10. Now, lastly, the findings here show that women are two times more likely to say that their personal income does not cover their everyday expenses and bills. Some staggering findings in this report. Now, if we look a little bit deeper, we actually noted that women are also likely to suffer more from financial stress. And what I'm showing you here is the level of agreement by gender of their money worries. Now, thinking through this, we observed that women do generally worry about money more than men. And even if I think to my own financial situation, I would absolutely say this rings true. You know, certainly as a mom of two boys who are on, honestly eating so much food, I'm constantly looking through our budgets on a week to week basis and ensuring that we're doing okay. And I would say that this is definitely more than that of my husband. So perhaps you might see this observation in your clients as well. Now, the researchers showed that only one in three women agree that they are free from all money worries but nearly half of men are. In fact, what this is also showing us is that the number of people or women in particular who worry about money is higher than those that don't. So we've seen in our previous studies here at Fidelity that financial wellbeing is also at the center of our broader wellbeing. As when we experience financial stress, this impacts on all other areas of our life, including our relationships, as well as our mental and physical health. Now, when asked to define financial independence, the most common answer that was given by women was having a personal income so that you don't have to rely on financial support from others. And financial independence also means being able to cover expenses and having savings that will provide for the future and allow women and men to make those significant life decisions. Now, what we've noted here was that women are also less likely than men to feel financially independent. In fact, fewer than one in two women say that they actually felt financially independent. Now, only three in five women of the survey also said that they had a personal income which was sufficient to not rely on anyone else for financial support. And as you can imagine, that number is considerably different for men, whereby over seven in 10 men suggested that they don't have to rely on anyone else. So I guess when you look or have a think about why this might be important, this dependence on others can also have a darker side, whereby the findings suggested that many women are also feeling trapped by their financial circumstances. So one in three women don't have enough savings to make those really big life decisions, whether that be changing their jobs, buying a new house, or even changing their relationship status. So some very eye-opening statistics for us. Now, if I look at this next slide, women are also less confident than men when it comes to financial matters. So whilst two in three women did say that they are confident in their ability to manage their own money, this is still significantly lower than men, where four in five. Similarly, just over half of the women surveyed felt confident to make their investment decisions, whilst more than seven in 10 were indeed confident. Now, I completely acknowledge that there could be a few reasons behind this, whether they be behavioural biases that come into the decision making here, or whether naturally women didn't feel like they had access to the right materials to make these big investment decisions. But it is still something that we can be aware of when speaking with our clients. Now, as a follow-on from this, 
when it came to levels of agreement of knowledge in financial matters, I did show that women tended to feel less capable than men as well. In fact, fewer than one in two women agreed that they were knowledgeable in financial matters. Now, as I'd mentioned before, there may also be a number of reasons as to why this is so. And here at Fidelity, we are advocates for increasing education and financial literacy, which can really help address these foundations into the future. Looking at this next slide, I must say I was a little shocked at this data, particularly as I'm as I, if I didn't plan, I would be completely, you know, um, you know, in, in trouble really. But the findings of this report did show that women have been less likely to look into the future and actively contribute to their superannuation. So here, four in ten women did say that they had a plan for retirement but one in three women disagreed that they have a plan in place for their retirement. So this is a great opportunity for advisors to engage this cohort of people. Now, slide nine really takes this one step further and looks specifically at superannuation contributions. And no shock here, the majority of women that are make or are not making additional uh, contributions to their superannuation. And even if they do, the level of contributions has been substantially lower than their male counterparts. Another area on this slide that's quite um, surprising is the fact that close to 8% of women surveyed didn't even know what percentage of income went into their superannuation. So again, some areas where we can really step up together. More positively though, I'm pleased to say that women are motivated and want to actually improve their financial well-being, and this is fantastic news. In fact, seven in 10 women said that they are highly motivated to achieve financial independence. Now, if we unpack what the opportunity though for us is in advice, two in three women say that they would like to take more control of their financial future, but just not sure what to do next. Now, there were, however, clues from the research as to how advisors may look to solve or address this. And the opportunity is enormous if we can start to take steps in this space. Now, one of these findings was actually around the fact that women want decision support, not necessarily everything done for them. So the statistics showed us that whilst two in three pre-retiree women want to work with an advisor, only one in 10 said that they were happy to outsource everything. So clearly there's a level of control that the female wanted to retain. And this was all about being empowered and knowledgeable for their investment decisions. Now, if I look at this slide, there is no doubt that across all levels of the financial services industry, the language and jargon used, along with complicated materials that we publish, really fails to connect with women in particular. The evidence is showing us that our industry is really missing the mark when it comes to communicating with women. So around one in two or 50% said that investment communication is complicated and one in four used the word intimidating. And of course, close to double thought it was more tailored to men. So this showed that investment communication resonates better with men who are far more likely to describe it as clear or helpful. Some areas where we can absolutely improve in the future. So what is the opportunity for advisors and how can we all look to address this as we step forward? Now, I'll start with some good news and that is that financial advice is indeed having a positive impact on women's lives. Older women in particular are suffering less financial stress and have more confidence in their capabilities when they have an advisor. Advised pre-retiree women are also less likely to worry about money than those who don't have an advisor. 
So from an advice perspective, we are doing a really good job. Around one in seven unadvised pre-retiree women rarely or never worried about money. But this actually reduced to one in five if they actually did have an advisor. So some really compelling statistics. Advised women also have more confidence in their abilities. So advised pre-retiree women are about five times more likely than those who don't have an advisor to rate their knowledge as very of financial matters as very good. Similarly, those that have an advisor are actually eight times more likely to rate knowledge of things like risk and return and understanding of investment strategies as very good. The value of advice is also actually quite different for women. So we've already noted that older women have a clear benefit from accessing the services of a financial advisor, along with tangibly improving their financial outcomes over time. And advisors do provide immediate benefits to women who are seeking advice. But interestingly enough, there are areas where financial advisors are not having as much of a positive impact with women as they are with men. And the research uncovered that we were not as effective in encouraging self-belief for women as opposed to, to men in general. Again, some areas where we can look to improve. So I guess when we think about this, advised women do indeed have higher well-being or higher satisfaction scores when they are indeed working with advisor. And this chart, although it focuses on early retirees, we do see similar differences between the unadvised and advised in pre-retiree women and experienced retiree women. So this really goes back to when you've got great financial well-being, you have higher levels of satisfaction across all facets of your life. So here is a little bit of a motivation model that might assist you when you're thinking about conversations with your clients in particular. And for people to have confidence to act, we looked at four key areas that should be satisfied. And first, they must want to take, I guess, control and embrace that change. And so self-determination, which is the baseline here, is actually the intention, conviction and willpower required to take control and engage with those financial decisions. And I think the problem that has been with self-determination is that it does need to be self-motivated. And advisors, unfortunately, we can't do that for our clients. However, with seven in 10 women already motivated to achieve financial independence, the need is rather for them to be empowered, not just motivated. Now, the second essential element here is the belief that we can make effective decisions necessary to get positive outcomes. So if I look at self-efficacy, a person with, self, or with high self-efficacy perceives those challenges as an opportunity to learn and master new skills rather than as a threat to avoid. The third factor in this motivational model is self-empowerment. So this belief that we can stick at it and follow through on our decisions on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis. And these sequenced elements really constitute the building blocks of self-belief that a difference can be made to our individual financial circumstances. And interestingly enough, the research did show that these are prerequisites for promoting financial confidence and the capability to get positive actions and behaviours from our clients. Now, I have highlighted here system trust, and I think trust in the system is indeed an essential factor for behavioural change. Thinking about some of these questions around do we trust the broader financial system and obviously the economic conditions that we currently operate in. So if I have a look at this, here is a little bit of an action plan that we have put together. And if you think about in your respective businesses of the women clients that you might be engaging with, do you communicate with them differently? Do you use different language or educational materials? And the trust barrier does indeed tend to be cited as one of the main barriers of engaging an advisor. 
Now, I'm sure many of us know that trusted relationships tend to be built over a period of time through things like consistent behaviour, transparency and the like. And so I think it's important for us to continually be generous with the information that we provide and the, and the work that you do as advisors are about being clear and setting clear expectations about what your clients are likely to experience. Women, um, I guess, have told us that they prefer advisors to focus on a priority issue. So the problem that actually needs solving or the job that needs to be actioned straight away. And what we noted through this research was that by scoping the service of your engagement in that way, women are much more likely to have a better and more suitable experience. Interestingly, we also noted that scaled or staged advice can be delivered more efficient, efficiently than comprehensive advice. So it also addresses women's other, majors, uh, other major barrier to accessing advice, which is that element of cost. Now, I'm sure many of you will agree with me that this is an ongoing challenge for our industry as the cost of advice has continually gone up over the last few years. From a communication standpoint in particular, I think many of us would say that regular communication is only a good thing. And particularly in environments when you've got um, bad news, communicating regularly with your clients can reduce things like information asymmetry and really balance the narrative that is set by the media on an ongoing basis and definitely does increase trust in the system. So as we know, this can be really evident given market volatility that we continue to experience on a, a yearly basis. So putting this all together, really does create a huge opportunity for us as advisors and also fund providers as we progress forward. Now, as you can see here, there are many areas that women differed significantly from male counterparts within the survey. Now, some of these findings and, and areas can be much more simple to fix than others. Things like the language that we use and the investment communication materials that we provide to clients, we can actually all do something for our clients by keeping it simpler in the future. Now, the steps that we outlined do indeed help prioritise the preferences of women and leverage psychological models that are needed for women to sustain motivation so that they can actually achieve financial independence that they desire. Now, some of these might not be largely different from what many of you are already doing with your clients. But if you can think about those clients that are yet to seek advice, this is a huge opportunity for the advisor community. Women will benefit and so will their families, communities, workplaces and the broader economy and society as a whole. So thank you so much for joining me today. And if you have any questions at all, please reach out to the team or visit our website, fidelity.com.au. Thank you.